My name is Bonnie Hoffman. I'm NACDL's Director of Public Defense Reform and Training. I'm excited to welcome you to this conversation today, Views from the Bench, Judicial Views on Pretrial Practices. Joining me for today's discussion are Justice Scott Bales and retired Judge Lisa Foster. W. Scott Bales is the Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. He was appointed to the court in 2005 and elected by his fellow justices to the position of Chief Justice in 2014. Under Justice Bales' leadership, the Arizona Supreme Court and the Arizona court system has eliminated the use of bail schedules and reformed their pretrial practices so that money bail has now become only a means of last resort. Prior to joining the bench, Justice Bales served at, in a number of different legal positions, including as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona, the Solicitor General for Arizona, and was a law clerk for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Lisa Foster is the co-director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center, an organization dedicated to the elimination of fees in the justice system and making fines proportional to the offense and the individual. She is the former director of the Office for Access to Justice at the United States Department of Justice, taking that position after 10 years as a Superior Court judge in San Diego, California. She began her career as a staff attorney at the Center for Law in, public, in the Public Interest in Los Angeles and as a staff attorney for LA's Legal Aid Foundation. Lisa Foster has a long career addressing fines and fees and other issues related to poverty and justice, working with state and local courts to address these issues. This program today is supported by grant number 2013 DBBXK015, awarded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. The Bureau of Justice Assistance is a component of the Office of Justice Programs, which also includes the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office for Victims of Crimes, and the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking. Points of views or opinions expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. So I want to begin today's uh, conversation by using the, the famous quote from the decision in 1987 from the Supreme Court in U.S. versus Salerno. In our society, liberty is the norm and detention prior to trial the carefully limited exception. Now, despite this construct, what we've seen is that over time, the use of money bail has increased and the use of pretrial detention has increased as well. Um, what I'd like to ask you both is what you see is the court's role in addressing these issues? Well, thank you, Bonnie. I think the court's role is uh, implicit in the quote from Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, we need to remember that people who are arrested and held pending the disposition of their cases deserve to be treated fairly and they enjoy a presumption of innocence and unnecessarily holding people until their cases are resolved has enormous social cost, wholly apart from the effects on the individuals. Thanks, Bonnie, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think the court's role is to think carefully and critically about the role of bail in our system today. Somehow over the last few decades, bail has been transformed from its original intent. And original intent goes back to England in the 13th century. And bail meant release. The purpose of any monetary condition is solely to assure a defendant's appearance at trial. And it should be used only in the cases where we are concerned about whether a defendant will appear at trial. If we're concerned about public safety, which is obviously a critical decision and a critical question when a judge is considering pretrial release or detention, we need to keep Justice Rehnquist caution in mind and realize that pretrial detention really is appropriate only in those cases where there are no conditions that we can impose on people to keep the community safe and to assure their appearance at trial. And that's a very small percentage of the defendants who appear before us. So keeping public safety in mind, because that is a, a concern for a lot of jurisdictions. How do you propose that courts consider the issue of public safety as it relates to bail? Well, I think as a starting point, it, it's important to identify the, the objectives that you're trying to achieve in, in deciding whether to hold someone pretrial. As, as Lisa's 
commented, there are really two goals. One is um, ensuring that they return for their trial, that they do not fail to appear. And the other, of course, is um, ensuring that if released, they do not commit other crimes um, while on release. And, and, you know, we've not in recent decades done a good job of focusing on how our practices mesh with accomplishing those goals. Because, for instance, if you're deciding whether people will be released or not based on whether they can pay a preset uh, bond amount based on a schedule, there's nothing in that that necessarily has any relationship to either the risk they won't show up or the risk that they will commit crimes. So I think you need to um, address those goals by keeping in mind what you're trying to accomplish and then asking what the tools you are, what you what the tools are that you have in order to guide your release decisions and if a person is going to be released, whether that will be subject to conditions. So beyond protection of society, are there some real consequences for individuals who are being held in pretrial detention? Absolutely. There are both consequences to the individual and consequences to the community at large. Um, with respect to individuals, the consequences can be severe. As, as little as three days in custody can cost someone their job, their housing, and even their children. Uh, most, of, most people, if they miss a day of work, can call their employer and say, sorry, I had to miss a day, there was an emergency, and keep their job. But two days, three days, a lot of people will lose their job. And that has an enormous cascade of consequences, particularly for folks who um, are often low-income people to begin with. Because, of course, the only people who are being held pretrial are people who cannot afford bail. And so they are at greater risk of, of losing their job and of suffering um, enormous economic consequences. If you lose your job, you can lose your housing. Women, um, for example, um, who are single parents may lose custody of their children as a consequence of pretrial detention. And we know that the growth population, unfortunately, in our jails and prisons today are women. But women are most likely to be in jail for a nonviolent offense or being charged with a nonviolent offense, and they are less likely than men to be able to make bail. And that disruption in a family's life has enormous consequences. Um, in addition to that, are there consequences in terms of the case impact themselves, what happens to people held in jail, and, and how their case outcomes may be different than those who are able to post bond? Well, there's data uh, indicating, and this isn't really a surprise if you think about it, that uh, people who are detained pending the disposition of their cases um, are more likely to plead guilty. Uh, there's data suggesting that they, uh, for a given level of offense, are likely to receive a longer sentence. And um, there are also, troublingly, is, is data suggesting that those individuals who are held pending the disposition of their cases um, may even have a greater likelihood of committing another offense when eventually released. An another uh, fact is it seems that those individuals are more likely to receive uh, sentences of imprisonment as compared to individuals who are released pending the disposition of their cases. So uh, in short, it seems like they are uh, likely to suffer more severe consequences for a given offense level than those who are released pending the disposition of the case. Let me also add that the impact on communities is great. Again, if we're concerned about public safety, um, what we know is that compared to those who are released within 24 hours, low-risk defendants who are detained two to three days were 40 percent more likely to commit new crimes while they were released than those who are released. And that number holds depending on the number of days that you're in custody. So we are actually causing more crime by detaining people than we would if we released low-risk defendants. And there's another consequence to communities that I think it's important to emphasize, and that is that paying bail bonds extracts millions of dollars from low-income communities. In Maryland, 
People arrested between 2011 and 2015 paid combined bail premiums of $356 million. And 75 million of that were in cases where either the charges were dismissed or the defendant was acquitted. Communities don't get that money back. That money goes to bail bond companies and insurance companies. And if you think about what $356 million could buy for, a, for low-income communities in Baltimore, um, in Maryland, it's, um, you begin to see what the costs are to, to those people and to the mothers and brothers and girlfriends of folks who are incarcerated. Well, and there are also significant costs to the community more broadly because when you unnecessarily hold uh, large numbers of low-risk um, defendants in jail pending the disposition of their cases because they can't pay a um, money bond. Those are very large costs to the public. I mean, literally um, millions of dollars, uh, at least in the jurisdiction I'm most familiar with, are spent every day uh, holding people in jail who don't necessarily pose significant risks of flight or a um, new criminal activity if they would be released and that's money that the pub those are costs the public bears that could be better used for other purposes without oh. question we're spending about 14 billion dollars a year in the united states on pretrial detention the most expensive pretrial supervision one could imagine is less expensive than holding someone in jail and when you think about that the costs that imposes pretrial detention imposes unnecessarily on the individual and the community, then the cost benefit is really um, weighs heavily in favor of pretrial release as the default and pretrial custody, the carefully limited exception. Well, a lot of people would say though, having money on the line, so I paid my bail money and with that I now have a financial stake in showing up to court and staying out of trouble is the mechanism to assure that people come to court and people you know, stay out of trouble, maintain good behavior while their cases are pending. Is there a, a reason to believe that that's not, that shouldn't be the case? Well, it's certainly not the case with respect to, main, to good behavior while you're out because bail bonds aren't forfeited if you commit a new crime while you're out on bail. The only reason that a bail bond is forfeited is if you fail to appear. So at least half the equation, it just isn't true. With respect to failure to appear, what we know is, in fact, the statistics uh, that Scott cited about um, the risk of uh, committing a crime while out on bail are true for failure to appear as well. That is, low-risk defendants are less likely to appear the longer they're held in detention pretrial. Is that connected to some of the concerns you expressed before regarding employment and connectivity and, and housing stability and some of the, the access to resources? Sure. If, if, if you've been held pretrial and you were at risk of losing your job while you were in jail, you might miss court because you're afraid that you're going to miss and you're going to lose your job if you show up for a court appearance. But also people's lives are complicated. and. We all sometimes miss appointments, and it, there's no reason to think that that's uh, that a bond is necessarily going to assure that someone appears in court. Justice Bill, one of the things you had mentioned is Arizona has moved away from the use of bail schedules, but that is a fairly common practice in a lot of places. Can you describe a little bit about what it was like to make that transition away from bail schedules and what some of the harms are of using bail schedules to make decisions about bond? Well, in, in Arizona, we were very interested in trying to use evidence-based practices to um, better achieve our, our goals in terms of public safety and assuring appearance. We realized, based on local data and national data, that whether a person could come up with a fixed bond amount had no relationship to the risk of flight or the risk of new criminal activity. We knew anecdotally, for instance, of circumstances where an individual charged with trespassing because they were homeless and they slept in a bookstore parking lot would languish in jail for several days because they couldn't come up with a few hundred dollar bond. 
And in contrast, in the very same jurisdiction, an individual charged with aggravated assault against his domestic partner was able to be released within hours uh, because as a professional athlete, he could easily come up with a $25,000 bond. So the bond schedule um, illustrates a major flaw in using monetary bonds to make release decisions. That is, uh, people who pose little risk are held simply because they don't have access to money. Conversely, people who may pose greater risk um, by the fortuity of having access to cash get out. And what we did uh, in Arizona is we, through a series of pilot projects, began implementing um, the use of risk assessments. And um, based on the success in the pilots, we uh, now have a risk assessment that's mandated for use statewide. And that's a tool the judges use in determining whether someone uh, should be released or not, and if they are released, what level of conditions are appropriate to um, protect the community and ensure they show up. Both of you have used the phrase a few times, low risk, high risk, um, and, and Justice Bales, you just mentioned risk assessment instruments. Um, certainly the, the use of risk assessment instruments has come under some questions of late. Um, and I want you to first talk about what you see as some of the benefits to risk assessment instruments that um, judges should think about, and then we can discuss some of the, the limitations of those instruments and some things to be concerned about with them. Well, um, risk assessments are, are tools that try to gauge um, the likelihood of, of a person failing to appear or a person committing new criminal activity if they're released until their case, before their case is resolved. The um, goal of the assessment, again, is to give the, the judge a tool to help them better make the release decision. If you didn't want to have any risk of flight and you didn't want to have any risk of new criminal activity, you just hold everyone. But that's not consistent with either our constitutional principles or, or rational public policy. And judges have, for centuries, one way or the other assess risk in deciding whether people will be um, released on bail or not. Um, what risk assessment tools do is they try to ground the um, assessment in objective empirical data and in assessment tools that will be applied uniformly across judges. Um, so for instance, in Arizona, the uh, risk assessment tool that we use consists of nine uh, objective questions that relate to the offense that's charged, the individual's prior criminal history, uh, any prior instances of failing to appear, uh, whether they've previously been incarcerated, and their age. And it's, um, it's a tool that, when it's applied, the results of the tool aren't going to vary depending on um, subjective factors related to the judge and it doesn't relate uh, under the tool to questions that might go to a person's um, socioeconomic background. Are there some concerns though about first of all the the use of these tools and, and you had mentioned you know that under the tool there isn't an implication of socioeconomic background but aren't there some things that are inherent in the tool that lead us to believe that there may be um, some factors that are accounted for or are perpetuated through the use of risk assessment instruments? So not all risk assessment instruments are created equally. And you have to look at the risk assessment tool that your jurisdiction is thinking about employing or the one they are employing to make sure that it doesn't have built into it certain racial disparities. We know there are racial disparities today in the use of bail. Bail amounts for African American men are 35% higher than bail amounts set for white men charged with the same offense and with the same criminal history. For Hispanic men, bail amounts are 19% higher than similarly situated white men. We don't want to perpetuate that problem in a risk assessment tool, and so it's important Number one, that it be analyzed to determine whether it has those racial disparities. Some do. There's been some good reporting about some instruments that perpetuate racial 
disparities, but also that it be locally validated, that it be about the circumstances in your particular community. The other thing for me that I think is important is for judges to understand what a risk assessment tool is actually telling you. So the analogy I like is, a, is insurance. My sister and I both have children the same age. And when they turned 16 and got their driver's licenses, we compared insurance premiums. I have a girl, she has a boy. And her premium for her son for driving was 50% more than mine for my daughter. Now why is that? It's because the insurance company used an actuarial table that predicts that boys are more likely to be in an accident, teenage boys in particular, than teenage girls. Now that doesn't say anything about her son or my daughter and which of them is actually a better driver or a safer driver. It's just an actuarial prediction. That is in effect what a risk assessment do tool is doing. It's taking someone like the defendant in front of you and giving you a prediction, but it's only that. And justice is an individualized assessment. You can use that tool as a judge to help inform your decision making, but if you rely on that alone and not take into account the person standing in front of you, you may make an error in either direction, either to release someone who may not be appropriate for release or more likely to detain someone who shouldn't be detained. We tend to think when the risk assessment tool comes back and says high risk, that that means the person should be detained. When in fact, if you understand the data, it actually doesn't really mean that at all. Most people who are high risk are really at very low risk of ever actually committing a crime while released. It's just that they're at higher risk than someone who comes out on the low end of the scale. So is there a role then um, with the instrument for advocacy? If, if the instrument is giving you this information and categorizing individuals, um, what role, if any, do you as judges see the advocates play in the courtroom? Well, I think there definitely is a role for advocacy because as, as Lisa has noted, the, the assessments are in some ways analogous to the actuarial calculations that are made with respect to insurance. So they're making generalizations about patterns of large numbers of people um, and whether a particular case c corresponds to that pattern or not can, can be argued and indeed should be argued. So uh, for example, most risk assessment tools recognize that age is a factor generally in terms of the likelihood both that a person will fail to appear and a person will commit um, other criminal activity for least. But you can certainly well imagine why a particular individual, although younger, may not in fact present greater risk as compared to others and that's the kind of thing that effective advocacy should address and that judges should consider. So is there though some concern um, given that some of the things that are considered in these risk assessment instruments include things like age at first arrest, number of arrests, number of court contacts, especially given what we know about the over policing of communities of color um, and those who, who tend to be in poor socioeconomic conditions? And is there a role that the court can play in taking that into account and making some of these decisions when faced with a risk assessment instrument? Absolutely, and again, I have to go back to the notion that um, justice is an individualized assessment of the circumstances, the crime that's charged, the person in front of you, and all of those factors have to be weighed in addition to the risk assessment tool. And as I said earlier, it's also important to make sure that the judges, the court understands the factors that are being considered by the instrument itself, and the court is satisfied that that's the appropriate approach. I'd add two observations. I think first, it's it's very important, as, as our comments have already reflected, that, that judges, when working with risk assessments, understand their limitations, 
and um, not mistakenly think that this is a, a device that's going to make the decision for them, which would um, misperceive the design of, of the risk assessments. Another point, though, that I think is important to recognize is if you're debating the utility of risk assessments, you have to consider what the alternatives are. And if, if the alternative, for example, is simply using an arbitrary schedule of um, bond amounts that determine whether a person comes or goes based on their access to cash, that has uh, demonstrably unfair consequences. We know across the country that the use of those kinds of schemes um, results in minority defendants being disproportionately detained pending the disposition of their cases as compared to others. If uh, instead you rely just on the subjectivity of the judges, we know that that's very susceptible to all kinds of implicit biases being manifest in the release decisions. I once had a judge tell me in response to our implementing the risk assessment tool that, well, you know, I really like to just look the defendant in the eye and size them up. And, and that made me very uneasy because I know how um, error-prone people are in their subjectively sizing up others. So I think we should not overestimate the um, role of risk assessments. We should be quite conscious of their limitations, but we should use them wisely. Um, another analogy that I, I think is somewhat apt is to compare a risk assessment to a thermometer. Um, if, if a doctor was trying to assess a patient's medical condition, they quite likely would want to know if they had a temperature. Um, you could put your hand on the patient's forehead and gauge something about their temperature, or you could use a thermometer. One tool is going to be more accurate than the other, but neither tool is going to be conclusive in trying to diagnose the condition. And, and I think um, if we recognize the limits of risk assessments, and we're quite um, conscientious in trying to continually validate them and assess how they're actually working in practice. They're a very um, useful and important tool in reforming pretrial justice. So let's talk about some of the places where some of this change has been implemented and we've found some success with it. Um, because I think there's always a concern as you move away from a system you have to something new about whether it's really going to work and what the long-term effects of that are going to be. So are there some places that are having success with the movement away from cash bond and a movement towards a more risk-based um, and, and less financially-based pretrial release system? So the certainly the system with the longest history is the federal system, which has operated under the Bail Reform Act since 1966. And judges in federal court ask two questions and they ask is the person a flight risk is the person a risk to community safety and they impose conditions that uh, are designed to address those factors if the answer to either question is yes and I understand federal system is not perfectly analogous to state systems but the closest and sort of the longest uh, or, and best analogy is the District of Columbia, which, uh, whose courts operate um, like a state, the same types of crimes that we see in state courts. And DC has basically used this model since 1992. Um, and overall, the statistics in the District of Columbia are quite um, astonishing. In 2017, 94% of defendants arrested in the District of Columbia were released. 88% of those made every single court appearance. 86% were not rearrested. And of those who were rearrested, less than 2% were charged with a violent crime. That's a pretty good success story. And it's been one that, as I said, has been um, in operation since 1992. Um, but there are others. Um, we've just seen reform um, enacted in Santa Clara County in California, where now they have fewer than 1,400 defendants detained pretrial in the first six months. Um, and the county saved $33 million, just coincidentally. 95% um, um, of those released made their court appearances, and 99% were crime-free while they were released. 
those are really great stories. And we're seeing um, Arizona's good results, as well as states that have um, uh, also enacted bail reform recently, like New Jersey, which has um, comparable statistics. Yeah, nationally, there's been significant efforts on uh, reforming pretrial detention practices and pretrial practices more broadly. Um, Lisa mentioned New Jersey, where under Chief Justice Stuart Rabner, they've, uh, over the last several years, uh, effectively eliminated the use of, of money bonds and significantly reduced their uh, population of people being held pre-trial. Um, and quite effectively, uh, they've uh, been able to manage the um, risk of, of non-appearance or criminal activity. And, and even before then, um, you saw efforts in Kentucky, for example, which eliminated the use of um, money bonds decades ago and has been very successful in um, its pretrial justice reforms. But if you go back to one of the things we talked earlier about, the consequences of unnecessarily holding people pre-trial, and, and you realize a state like Missouri, or not a state like New Jersey, um, has reduced by thousands the daily jail population. That translates into not only liberty for those individuals, which is vitally important, but it also translates into less crime. Um, it translates into reduced costs to the public for jailing people. It translates into people being better able to hold their jobs and to keep their families together. So let's say you, as a judge, right, are convinced this is the right way to go. Um, we need to move away from money bail. We need to move away from bail schedules. Um, how do you, as a judge, as a justice, as a court official, bring about that kind of change um, and get buy-in from other system actors who may not be as open to this? Well, you have an expert before I you. do. <laughs> Well, I, I think if you're, if you're going to work in this area, it's, it's um, important to articulate what it is you're trying to accomplish. And that's why the, the quote by Justice Rehnquist um, is repeated in, in different forums. Um, we, we have to start from the recognition that we're talking about people who've not been convicted. They've been charged with an offense, but they enjoy the presumption of innocence and they deserve to be treated fairly in our justice system. Um, we also need to recognize how many different consequences unnecessarily holding people in jail has um, for the community in general. Um, to, to affect change, I think if you point out to people, we are unnecessarily spending money in ways that increases rather than reduces crime. That tends to get people's attention from whatever perspective they look at criminal justice issues. And then if you say, um, we know based on national data that unnecessarily detaining low-risk people um, has the consequences that we've described, um, I think you can then begin to get support for changing things. Um, we now have a fairly um, rich track record of successfully replacing um, money-based uh, pretrial detention systems with uh, systems that are based instead on assessing risk and trying to manage it intelligently. And um, the path to reform uh, is very dependent on the circumstances of individual jurisdictions. In some states, uh, reform has taken not only statutory change, but constitutional amendments. Um, New Jersey is an example. Uh, New Mexico, under the leadership of Chief Justice Charlie Daniels, is another. Um, but in other jurisdictions, you can accomplish a lot through administrative orders and rulemaking and education of court personnel. So can you walk through, because that's, that's the process that you used in Arizona, can you walk folks through how you were able to accomplish some things? Because there's often, I think, a concern from the judiciary. They don't control the money. Um, they don't control the laws. And that with that, there's a limit on the types of changes that they can effect. 
Well, reform is easier in jurisdictions where you have a unified court system and uh, some supervisory authority uh, vested in the Supreme Court, and that's, that's true in many jurisdictions. Um, to affect change in a real way, you have to convince the, the trial court judges who are making release determinations that changing um, old ways of doing things is a good idea. And I think um, judges generally are committed to the ideal of, of um, equal justice under law. And once you explain to them that we have better tools to help them make the decisions fairly, once you show them the uh, evidence, you um, reaffirm through training and through supporting their efforts through things like pretrial services, uh, I think getting the buy-in by the judges is, is something that's generally speaking, um, easy to do. A, a different problem you mentioned is, is the money, uh, and that often relates to how budget decisions are made at the local level. Um, to reduce um, the number of people detained effectively may require greater pretrial services, and that may come out of one budget bucket that's different than the bucket that pays for jails. Um, in our experience, if you went to uh, um, municipal city councils or the county boards of supervisors and explained how in terms of the county-wide budget you could actually save money by reforming pretrial practices, uh, eventually you would get support for reform efforts there as well. So one of the concerns I think that comes up is sometimes the fear that comes as we move away from this, this system, whether you're relying on a bail schedule, whether you're relying on money, um, of if I release the wrong person, if something happens in the community as a result, um, is there a way for courts to, to address that reality? Um, because unfortunately that is a reality that we've seen happen uh, as we've moved from, away from cash bail and into a more risk-based system. So I think there are really two uh, parts to the answer to that question. The first is, is to really look at the data. Um, in three out of four criminal cases are misdemeanors, where the sanction is a fine or at most a year in custody. In a recent study in Miami-Dade County in Florida, the most common sentence for all felonies and misdemeanors is credit for time served. And the second most common is probation. So if we think about generally who, who the defendants are in front of us and what the crimes are that they've committed and what the sanctions are, it's less of a risk than people think. But more importantly, we have the same risk now, only more so. Because today the decision about whether someone's released in most jurisdictions or is detained is solely a function of whether that person has money or access to money to make bail. And so we see cases where someone who made bail is goes out and commits another crime, and sometimes a violent or horrendous crime. I, I think that risk is as much a part of the system today as it would be um, under another model and a model that really sees more people released. We also have to recognize that risk and, as judges, back each other up. We're going to make mistakes. We're human. Um, whether we have a perfect risk assessment tool, which we don't have, um, whether we have a jurist who has had a long career and never had something like this happen, but it happens, we have to be able to say as a judiciary that we're not perfect and mistakes um, can be made, but this is the best way we know how to proceed. I think for, for judges, um, the decision whether to release a person pending the disposition of the case can be one of the most important decisions in the case um, in many respects. And as, as Lisa noted, um, those decisions are sometimes difficult and those decisions are not like any other decisions judge makes judges make they won't always be made the right way but we have to accept that as inherent in in our system of justice I don't think 
you can avoid it um, or you should avoid it by instead letting that decision be made by default in a way that systemically generates even more bad decisions in terms of unnecessarily holding people who simply cannot come up with money bonds or conversely releasing people who do pose a risk of either flight or criminal activity merely because they have resources. So one of the concerns that that follows then is if we move away from money bond, um, often what we move to is a system of pretrial release with various conditions. Um, And and there's certainly some concern that's been expressed that courts are now going to substitute um, money for the use of of significant conditions. Um, Some people would say, how can it hurt? How can it hurt to provide somebody with more structure or more resources or more services? Um, But there's reason to believe that that, in fact, can have, have a negative effect. So I think we have to be careful. Again, I go, I go back to the notion of the individual. Um, one of the things that I certainly was guilty of when I was a judge, and I think um, kind of pervades um, particularly large um, urban courts today, is a sense of speed. That we are, we're all moving fast. We have um, large dockets. We need to get through them. Um, and in some ways, I think the best thing we can do is to slow down and to actually look at the, the person before us and make some assessment about what's appropriate. In, again, going back to places where we have some experience, in the District of Columbia, 25% of the people who are released are released with absolutely no conditions at all other than a promise to appear and to obey the law. Um, That is sometimes all that's necessary. If we're talking about, um, as Scott's example, a a homeless person who was trespassing, that's probably all that's necessary. Or perhaps some assistance in getting shelter would be useful um, because that would, more than anything else, likely assure their appearance in court if they they had a roof over their heads. Um, But that... um, that's often all that's required. In some cases, more is required, but we have all kinds of tools and they should be used appropriately. For someone who we believe is a flight risk, um, then you can have a electronic monitoring, um, but that should be used only for people who genuinely are a flight risk. Um, and there are um, sort of less onerous ways of reminding people to come back to court. Um, in Arizona, they use text messaging, which has proven to be effective, and that's true in um, lots of other jurisdictions. Um, what is appropriate for a particular person? It may be that a phone call into pretrial supervision on a regular basis, whether that's weekly or biweekly or monthly. It may be that an, an in person appearance is important because of who that person is. But we have to craft the conditions to fit the circumstance and the only way we can do that is really to look at the person before us. And I think we also should be conscious of some important lessons we know from uh, probation practices around the country. It, It has been shown that unnecessarily imposing conditions on probation can actually perversely make it more likely that a person will be revoked from probation or will in fact commit an offense um, while under probation. And, And somewhat analogously, we know that if you have a person who's on release pending the disposition of their case, you, you don't want to, um, unnecessarily subject them con- to conditions that are just going to yank them back into jail because that then's going to trigger the various um, bad consequences we described earlier. So what is important is that you, speaking from the perspective of the court, that you tailor the conditions of release to ensuring, again, your goals of preventing new criminal activity or assuring an appearance. So it's not a binary decision. Do you hold a person or just let them go? You try to tailor the um, release decision to the circumstances, and that will promote justice and better achieve the, the goals of public safety. Is there also a concern? There's a finite number of resources, right? Whether whether we're using them for incarceration or we're using them for pretrial supervision, is there a concern when we over service low risk, low end offenders that what we do is we actually take away resources that we could use to better serve those those individuals who may 
pose a greater risk or who may actually be in need of greater services. Sure. I mean, we, there, there's always um, a dollar spent unnecessarily um, is a dollar wasted, and we shouldn't be doing that. Um, we should think about both um, spending those dollars in more appropriate ways, providing what I think all of us recognize would um, immensely help public safety, which is providing mental health services, providing drug treatment services for many of the folks who appear before us, that is going to address the underlying cause of their criminal behavior and keep us all safer. If we can spend those dollars there instead of in pretrial detention or instead of over conditioning, we'll be better off. So does that come from taking maybe a little more holistic view of funding for a criminal justice system as opposed to the system we tend to see right now, which is that there are silos of money. A county may pay for the local jail, but the state may pay for an inmate in a, in a prison, or um, the county may be responsible for policing, but the state is responsible for the attorneys. And, and so we don't have that ability to really effectively manage what the costs of one part of the system implicate on another part of the system. That, that is a challenge. Um, in Arizona, we were able, though, to um, get support for pretrial justice reform by going to, um, for instance, city councils. Um, their municipal judges make decisions that affect whether people are detained on low-level um, offenses, but uh, when, they're, when they are detained, they're held in the county jail, and the cities uh, ultimately build for those costs. So um, the judge making the decision may not recognize that fiscal consequence, but the city council recognizes it and um, at the end of the day proved to be very supportive at trying to shift some resources to um, pretrial supervision as opposed to um, just continuing to pay the cost of unnecessarily housing people in the county jail. So you, you have to try to identify where the budget authority is and, and leverage support for uh, improvements based on that. So I want to talk about a couple of tools that have proven to be very effective and, and actually proven to be very low cost um, investments for communities to make. And one of them is the use of court reminders. Um, I understand in Arizona that's something that has been implemented and we've seen it a few other places. Can you discuss a little bit what that program involved and, and how successful it's been? Well, I, I, you know, in a way this seems obvious. I think anyone who has recently made a restaurant reservation or, or scheduled an appointment with their dentist or doctor has probably had at least one, if not more, text or telephone reminders of the appointment. And there is a self-evident reason why uh, various service providers do that. It's effective. It helps ensure that people don't uh, fail to show up. And, and um I'm, I'm delighted that in Arizona, in the pilot projects we've used, um, the failures to appear have dropped significantly, sometimes on the order of 50 percent, uh, through some type of text notification system. Um, and, and you see similar successes around the country. There are different ways of doing it. Um, we, we discovered that something as simple as when a person was first arrested, making sure that the officers get a cell phone number if they have one, could be very uh, helpful in successfully implementing this kind of system because, um, you know, in today's world, more people have cell phones than have permanent addresses. So. Um, just that kind of minor systemic change allowed more effective um, pretrial case management in the sense of avoiding failures to appear. What's your answer to some courts would say, you know what, a person should take personal responsibility for showing up to court, and if they can't remember that, why should I, my clerk, or my staff, or court services spend their time reminding them about their court dates? They should demonstrate some personal accountability for it. Well, one could say that, as Scott indicated, about all of us who should take personal responsibility for our doctor and dentist appointments or for anything else in our lives. Look, people's lives are complicated, and particularly people who are low-income folks who are often trying to work two and three jobs, they've got families, their lives are busy and complicated, and 
in the stress of a moment when they're standing in court and they get told a date to come back, they, and maybe they're handed a piece of paper that maybe gets misplaced, if you try to call the court, sometimes it's hard to get through to a live human being who can tell you when your actual court appearance is. It's just recognizing the reality of people's lives. And we should make it easier for people to come to court and including if they can't make the date that we've given them, being flexible about rescheduling. So when that text message comes, it's also really helpful that it come with a phone number where someone might answer the phone and be able to reschedule an appearance if there's a good reason why the person can't make the appearance. Um, those kinds of things are just recognizing the reality of everybody's lives. Yeah, and I, I think um, not only is it important that courts help people satisfy their their court imposed obligations but we should recognize these are very inexpensive um, ways um, whether it's a text reminder or automated call it, it is a very very small cost particularly as compared to the cost of issuing warrants and taking up court resources and time that could be better spent on other things if you avoided the failure to appear in the first place so the other movement that we've seen in a number of places that have moved away from cash bail is also a reorientation of the process um, getting bail hearings to happen earlier, um, investing more authority in uh, magistrates or pretrial services officers to make some of those early release decisions to minimize the amount of time that individuals are being held. Um, do you believe that, as a court system, that that is an effective way to start to, to re-address the issue of bail and reconsider some of the factors that we know um, have those lasting impacts, those, those first 24 hours, 48 hours that somebody's incarcerated? Well, I think if your goal is avoiding some of the negative consequences that result if a person's held unnecessarily even for a few days, it's, it's vitally important that you very early in the process get an initial assessment of whether there's a need to um, hold a person at all beyond a, a own recognizant or perhaps a, a unsecured uh, appearance bond. Uh, if there is going to be a determination that for instance, they're potentially non-bailable, that hearing then should follow as promptly as possible and, and there should be an opportunity to um, litigate the issues where the defendant has the assistance of counsel. And again, this is to ensure the fairness of the process and to avoid um, our basically creating um, the very problems people would say pretrial detention is is meant to avoid that is the recurrence of crime and a failure to appear and i think with respect to authorizing the release of low-risk defendants many jurisdictions do that de facto today but the authorities with law enforcement so in in many places law enforcement has the option of citing and releasing someone when they give them a, 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 when they arrest them for a misdemeanor or they bring them in. And having a system that actually looks at the nature of the offense and has a more regularized practice, I think, um, may result um, in better changes to that system. So the last part of this is once we've implemented those changes, um, is there a need to continue to evaluate, reevaluate, um, collect data to reassess this, the, the changes once they've been made? Without question. Data is what I think got us to this point. It's the recognition that there's a problem with the current system is one that has been data-driven. We've relied on it today, but courts have been relying on it all over the country, and um, that's critical. And it's important to look at how our systems are performing, how, what, how many people are actually being released, how many of those folks are making their court appearances, how many of those folks um, are obeying the law while they're out. Um, that data is critical because it then allows us to make necessary adjustments if we're not able to achieve the results that we want to achieve. So is there, in that group, uh, the data we're collecting, the people who are a part of that reevaluation process, are there what you see as sort of key components or key participants to any kind of coalition to bring about and reevaluate uh, pretrial practices? Well, it's interesting if you, if you look at the reform efforts that have occurred around the country, there has been support 
from, from people who come at the criminal justice system from very different perspectives. And, and I think that does relate to the fact that when you step back and you look at the data, you see we've had a dramatic increase in the portion of people in our jails who are being held pretrial pending the disposition of their cases. We see uh, consistent evidence across the country about the untoward consequences that result if you unnecessarily hold people until their case can be resolved. And I'm talking about the increases in the likelihood they'll commit crime, that they'll fail to appear, the consequences to them and their families in terms of economic and social dislocation. So whether you look at criminal justice from a um, court perspective or a um, defendant's counsel perspective or a victim's perspective, I think people uh, can readily agree that the old ways of doing things in this arena aren't working and that we ought to assess what our goals are, what are better tools to reach them. And as we implement reforms like um, risk assessment tools, we should be quite conscientious in checking how we are doing as we go along and trying to identify better ways to accomplish our goals. And I think just as, as a final note in that regard, it's, it, it's important to bake the data collection into whatever reform you're making. It has to be there at the outset, not something that a year or two years into a program we think, oh, we should be collecting data about this. It should be part of the reform and capturing the, the points that we think are necessary and involving the broader criminal justice community in that conversation. So when we're talking about reform, it's important to include prosecutors and public defenders and law enforcement and the county or city that's paying the bills in the conversation and in determining what are the important data points that we need to be sure uh, we capture in order to evaluate the system. So in a sort of set of closing remarks, are there things that you feel you'd want your fellow judges, your fellow justices um, to, to think about when it comes to making this move in moving away from cash bail and moving to a, a non-cash bail system? I think for me and for many judges, we view the justice system as just that. It's a system. And like any system, those of us who are players in it tend to think that the way things are today are the way they have always been and the way they should always be. And I think if we have an honest conversation about pretrial detention, if we ask ourselves, what are the goals we're trying to achieve? And can we do this better than we're currently doing it? We will shift our perspective and recognize that the system we're in is not doing a very good job and we need to fix it. And that's a hard conversation to have. It takes a willingness to engage, to look at data honestly and critically. But I think when we do that, we will make changes. Yeah, um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said something to the effect that our legal system is civilized to the extent that it is conscious of what it is doing. And I think in the pretrial justice arena, that is markedly true. Um, we need to assess how the system impacts those that are caught up in it as arrestees. We need to assess how it's affecting our goals of public safety. And if we do that, um, I think it's uh, going to be uh, clear that we need to change the way things traditionally, unthinkingly, um, without recognition have been done in terms of determining whether people are held or not until their cases are resolved. But I think that holds great promise to um, reaching a system that will be fair to those affected and will better um, use limited public resources to promote public safety. Thank you both very much.